uh, so what uh, in uh, i know this is the last session and i'm sure you have already uh, gone through uh, quite a heavy dose on this uh, on alternatives and pms so i'll try to keep it brief uh, 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 in this session what i'm trying to focus predominantly uh, is on the real estate and particularly financialization of the real estate so real estate as we all know it's one of the very old traditional asset class uh, and uh, what we call it's it's the ultimate consumer durables with very very high utilitarian value uh, we traditionally if you ask our parents grandparents or their forefathers the traditional investments were always in either real estate and gold and it has over a period of time it has proven its worth people have seen uh, how the asset values have increased and how they could make good investment in this asset class. so coming to the basics of this asset class and uh, looking at uh, uh, looking at the value chain of real estate typically uh, we divide that into three buckets one is the land second is the development and third is what we call is built out so the first stage, which is land. So real estate is essentially land, right? Any, any real estate you take uh, underlying or the literally beneath, physically beneath any real estate asset, there will always be land. And land we typically uh, divide into three parts, agricultural, non-agricultural, and infrastructure. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the names are self-explanatory, but just to give you a context, whenever uh, a town or city is developed the first stage of that is that the land is get gets converted for its non-agricultural use it's converted for development that's when the first leg or the first stage of value addition um, in value, value addition happens. the second is what we call is infrastructure when a certain part of uh, land or certain area is integrated into uh, the master plan of a city uh, and it gets uh, it gets connected with the main hubs with the, the infrastructure like the roads power sewage system etc put into place that's the next level of value addition which happens in the land so this is the first leg or the first stage uh, of land where uh, the journey of real estate starts and where stage by stage the value addition happens. next is what we call is development so let's now a certain uh, now let's go to the next phase so within the development plan of the city within the boundaries of the city now a developer or a builder or an individual he takes a piece of land and envisages a development there uh, so the first where broadly let's say somebody has acquired uh, a land and envisaged development but where you there is broadly just a master plan that's the first stage within the development was what we call is non-approved where predominantly the broader concept broader layout of the development is uh, envisaged the next is when you have gone through the process of seeking appropriate approvals for uh, doing the development or constructing a building with its residential commercial retail etc etc when it is approved that's the next stage of value addition and finally when you start the construction or when the development happens so this is the second uh, bucket what we call is development and the third is what we call is built out where one the first stage is what we call as oc second is cc or completion and in many places these terms are used interchangeably so essentially it's the completion of a particular project that's when the that's the next critical and important milestone and uh, after that the final is what we call is in feed when uh, the completed building or the completed uh, project and the surrounding on it they become part of a integrated area so let's i think let's take example of uh, away in mumbai so originally in the 19 let's say uh, let's go back only till about 1980s when that was a barren land it, it it was part of let's say city's master plan so we will start with let's say uh inland stage two or stage three uh that's when 
uh, the infrastructure, the road around it, et cetera, was there. Then the next, the development stage. So from almost say 2090 till early 2000, this is the development stage where uh, this particular developer, Hiranandan, it has, it has conceptualized the master plan, then slowly each and every building, whether it's the residential, commercial, real, retail, it kept or he kept on building and constructing. That's where the approvals, the construction happened. Then if we look at uh, particularly post-2000 or particularly, let's say, post-2003 or four, that's when the township was complete. But after that, it really started becoming what we call is this infield uh, stage when a lot of offices started uh, uh, moving there. Those got occupied, a lot of retail started moving there. And today, this area is one of the, let's say, prime portions or prime part of the city. So that's the last stage of the value addition, what we call is a built out, which has happened. <clears throat> For real estate, as uh, the appreciating nature of real estate, it has attracted investors and people over centuries, over a period of time. And it has proven its worth as a trusted asset class. However, however it may be appealing, it comes with its own set of challenges. And that's where this financialization or investing into this asset class through a different mechanism. So traditionally, all of us, uh, including our forefathers, we had been investing in the real estate in the form of physical uh, asset, whether it's your home, your office, your shop. Uh, we buy a particular asset and hold it, use it, and for a period of time, its value increases. That's something we have uh, been doing. But today, uh, with the financialization of real estate, you have financialized instruments available. One can invest in this through alternatives. And we'll try to explain why fundamentally uh, it is better and why it is different from investing in direct physical asset. So very uh, simply speaking, there are three broader challenges. One is it's, it's a complex asset class. You know, there is a, whether you want to invest in residential, commercial, retail, hotel, warehouse, data center. First, one needs to understand that. Second, once you have got some clarity on that. Secondly, which city, which part of the city you want to invest? Thirdly, what mix between these asset classes you want to have? Fourthly, how do you invest? Whether you want to uh, invest directly or uh, use some instrument with which developer you want to invest. These are the various challenges uh, which are there. Second, it's illiquid. Let's say somehow you have figured out the answer to the first question. Investing in easy, getting in easy, but getting out is very, very challenging. It's an illiquid asset class. Uh, uh, at what stage one has to exit, when the exit will happen, how the exit will happen, what is the assurance, what is the surety, uh, in what is the strategy for exit. These are the key challenges in this stage. And finally, it real estate always requires higher ticket size. Uh, but through alternatives, these challenges could be overcome. So it, although it's a complex asset class, there is a professional team uh, which is managing it. Uh, and since it's done from a skilled team, uh, the, there is a scientific method to address which asset class to take exposure at, at what stage one wants to take exposure, through what instrument you should take, which developer, these are very, very well professionally managed. Second, although the asset class by itself is illiquid, but when the investment happens in a institutionalized alternatives way, some of these exits are inbuilt. Also, the exposure taken is such that you get at a particular stage. Uh, the way uh, the investment is structured, it's envisaged, it's monitored. There is a natural path, natural progression which happens to these assets, and that's how the exits are uh, uh, ex exits are realized. Additionally, there are contingency plans which uh, the professionally managed funds keep uh, in mind, and they incorporate into these investments. And lastly, even though for uh, these investments are of high ticket size since it's a pooled vehicle, it's a pooled fund for individual investor, the amount which he needs to invest, that comes down uh, substantially low. Uh, very simply, 
uh, what we are trying to say is what are the advantages, what is the difference between investing directly in physical real estate versus investing through fund. Uh, first is by investing in real estate, you are uh, achieving asset diversification that's possible physically as well as whether you invest in fund. Second, the geographic diversification. Only a fund can give you exposure to different cities or within a city to different micro markets uh, individually or taking exposure in physical real estate that's not possible developer diversification like a fund typically when a fund invest uh, we invest in let's say about six to ten or twelve uh, projects and uh, that with the de developer diversification also geographic diversification achieved which is not possible when you do a direct investment uh, when the the power of negotiation when fund invests with anyone that's a significant amount of money and when the amounts are large the negotiations the rights the control mechanism uh, these are put into place versus an individual trying to invest whatever may be the amount uh, individually with a developer uh, the, some of the investment avenues might be available but the rights and the negotiating or bargaining power is not available uh, then the fund does its own due, due, due diligence. There is a significant asset management or monitoring which happens with this project. Uh, the payments are secured by creating various collaterals, security mechanisms, etc. Uh, and since the amount which is managed is at a larger scale, the managing cost or the overhead cost, as we call that, comes down significantly. And the only perhaps drawback is the investor doesn't have the discretion to make the investment choice that right is with the fund manager uh, simply put these are the various segments or asset classes in real estate where one can invest whether it's residential commercial retail hospitality industrial or warehousing etc uh, simply put if we look at risk return parameter uh, the product uh, what I try to depict here is simple three types of products. For the first is what we call is the core. These are the completed rent generating assets. So REIT is the great example of that where, excuse me, one is taking exposure to a completed asset. So practically the risks are very low. That's the only risk you run is the vacancies or the lease rentals, what one generates. So the core or rent generating asset is what we call is low risk, low return. Uh, uh, the next stage is what we call is the development. So if, uh, if I refer back to my first slide where we have said we divide real estate into three buckets. One is land development and third is what we call is uh, uh, infill. So infill or completed asset, that's what uh, the REITs uh, correlate to. In the development stage, there are risks, but these are medium risks. Similarly, the returns are uh, medium. So uh, here, what uh, the, the stage at one we invest is at the development stage where the land is already in place. Some of the approvals are already in place and essentially you are waiting for the development to get completed and then the exit to happen. Uh, and in at this stage, one can take exposure within the form of debt or equity. For example, at Axis, we have a, a fund which is uh, which focuses on the development stage of residential real estate, and that's in the form of debt. So this is a real estate debt at the development stage. This is what we call is at the medium risk and medium return stage. And finally, uh, real estate equity. This is again at the development stage. So one may not come. Uh, so one may take exposure still in the development stage. However, uh, the nature of investment is in the form of equity. So the returns are not capped and potentially one can make better returns. But similarly, the risks associated with that also uh, are relatively higher. So uh, Axis, also like that Axis AIF, we have a fund which focuses on commercial real estate. And here the underlying nature of investment is equity. So there the uh, return and risk profile is relatively higher uh, as compared to the other two. Uh, so uh, what, we are, what we are trying to say, simply put, uh, the higher we go up in the value chain, 
the returns are going to be less volatile because in AIFs in general, what happens or alternatives, what happens is uh, here, many of these funds, uh, and I, I will, I'll just go back to the previous one. I, I think just the last point here, uh, when through alternatives, when we invest in real estate, the idea is not to make so much return from the price appreciation because in real estate, if I ask you, what is, what is the underlying strategy? What is the underlying nature of the investment? Typically, the idea is you buy low and sell higher. Like we see, we see in trading like that. One expects that I will buy whether it's a home or office. Uh, and within that also one would think that, you know, I'll buy at the early stage when the development has just started. So by when it finishes, uh, I will get premium. One is because the uh, nature or the risks associated are low. Also, the price will appreciate and the price had been appreciating over a period of time. Uh, but that's the uh, strategy or that's the game when one takes exposure or one takes punt in form of physical real estate. That's the strategy. But in alternatives, most of the time, it's not just the price appreciation, which is the basis uh, of the investment. For example, the real estate date, the underlying principle is that you look at the margins. So even with the same prices which are there, for example, if the debt is being given to a residential real estate project, the way the underlying happens or the way the investment strategy is, it assumes that the prices will remain stable, stagnant for the next five years. And that's the, which is, let's say, a typical uh, life cycle of a project. If with that assumption, if there is enough margin, if there is enough surplus, if there is enough enough juice in that project then only that investment happens similarly when the investment is done in the form of equity the underlying assumption in most of these cases is that you don't assume that the price are going to escalate uh, at an astronomical rate or even at a normal uh, inflation adjusted rate and with that you will basis inflation only you will make return that that's never the case the the when alternatives invest in real estate essentially you are taking exposure you are investing in the business rather than on a particular asset and you're trying to get returns from the appreciation in the value so uh so so if you look at these four avenues so uh what we are saying is one can invest in real estate as a physical asset that's the basic strategy secondly let's say if one wants to do financialization well even real estate stock that's a financialized instrument you can invest but again you will take exposure to a particular company and taking exposure to let's say few companies you can still achieve diversification but uh, still that's a limited or concentrated way the next is REITs which is a fund a pooled vehicle where you will get diversification but again the at the base, the core strategy remains the same is low, low risk, low return kind of game. And finally, the real estate AIF here, each fund will have its strategy, whether as I said, whether it's a residential debt or commercial equity. And there, all the features of a typical fund, the diversification in terms of geography, developer, having the professional fund management, all these are in place. So the AIF or alternatives or in this case, as you we go higher, the returns are uh, expected to be less volatile. Uh, again, this is a simple, uh, uh, I think, a repetition of what I said, so I'll just keep this. Uh, and now coming to the basics of financialization, why, what has uh, catalyzed the process of financialization of real estate? As we all know, uh, around 2017, three large changes happened, which have, uh, been there particularly for the real estate. These three things are demonetization, GST, and RERA. Uh, and this has completely transformed this sector. Till, uh, till these uh, things came into place, although real estate was slowly going in the direction of being organized, structured market, but these three things which came together in a short span of time, they have completely metamorphosed uh, this industry because of demonetization, a lot of cash element which was there and which was uh, limiting the play for institutional player, for institutional investor, for creating regularized uh, investment vehicles. Those were those constraints got removed post demonetization because the 
cash element from this industry uh, has been vanished. Secondly, GST ensured that throughout the value chain, the impact of uh, or the effectiveness of doing business in a proper way, in an accounted way, it has come on the foot. And finally, RERA, which is an absolutely, absolutely game changer uh, in this sector. This has ushered of ushered an era of financialization. And very broadly speaking, this has brought like three things into place. One is the governance. Uh, what RERA has done is pre-RERA, this particularly on the residential real estate, this was completely dominated and one-sided play with developers, which has got changed. It had made the developers responsible. Today, before selling any residential, one has to first get all the approvals, register the project on the RERA. Or you have to give a definite timeline. You have to give all the specification design, how it's going to be developed. And it is essential to complete the project within the timelines. Otherwise, there are heavy penalties, including imprisonment, which have made uh, this industry or the players to be very, very disciplined. All the people who were fly by night operators, not so much wanting to follow the rules, who had buyers well-being or buyer's interest who had kept it absolutely at bay, all those had to weed out, all those have to go out from this industry. Secondly, there are substantial clauses for buyer protection. So the advance taken, the, the I think one of the key problem with residential real estate was the diversion of funds which was got from or the advances from buyers which a developer gets for a particular project. And then it has various uses predominantly going in buying the next land etc so rera is ensuring that if somebody is collecting advances it goes in the development of the project uh, there the uh, even the contracts today they are absolutely fair sided which used to be absolutely one sided earlier there is a, a rera affiliate who gives you a speedy just uh, justice uh, so on and so forth and finally market expansion rera has really made real estate a well-defined and pre-specified product with definitive timeline. And that facilitates the uh, entry and that facilitates the funding of organized player uh, like us into uh, this sector. Uh, AI, these are the, some of the snapshots. I think all of us are in this industry. So I'll just uh, skip this structure also we all know and very briefly uh, uh, what i'll do is i'll just spend about uh, five minutes to give you overview of what's happening particularly in the residential real estate and commercial real estate so uh, uh, the last two years the calendar year 2020 and 2021 like all other businesses real estate also got impacted uh, by rera by sorry by covid however the comeback or the bounce has been substantial and few of the things which noticeably happened during covid and post covid one is that during the covid the importance of having uh, in the traditional way what we call is having a roof on the head or having your own home it got underlined it got underscored uh, because people realized our home that was our first line of defense against the covid so a lot of people who were fence sitter who wanted to buy but had not made that decision this time a lot of people took that decision they bought it uh, so if, if uh, from the graph as it uh, clear the 2020 the both demand and supply uh, which is basically new launches they got impacted but from 21 it started slowly coming back and the first half of 2022 the sales they have been highest since calendar year 2013 uh, this is a data by night frank and the Again, this comprises of data of uh, first uh, of the top eight or cities. Uh, even the launches or sales, uh, they are highest since almost 2013. And there's substantial improvements which we have seen. Secondly, in terms of prices, again, this is a data across the cities. Uh, and the range is between 3 to 9%. So on average, about uh, the prices have gone up about 4 to 5%. Uh, one of the key things, uh, uh, why... Uh, this has happened and I think we'll cover in the next slide. And before that, the inventory or uh, the unsold units, as we call, uh, this also uh, is slowly coming down. So as on the first half of 2022, there's still about 440,000 units. These are in the top eight cities uh, of India, which are unsold. 
Uh, this is an interesting uh, slide. Uh, this is again by search by Spark Real Estate. So we have used it as a placeholder, but it matches our thought process and how we look at the residential real estate. Typically, the cycle in residential real estate uh, is about eight to 10 years, where almost for about uh, six to seven years, we'll see stagnation or uh, slowdown. And then there is uh, the thing, uh, then there is a rebound and things go up sharply within the next two to three years. So the last peak of this cycle was seen somewhere around 2014. From 2014 to almost 2020, uh, this uh, there was a contraction uh, and then there was a recession. And from 2020 uh, onwards, uh, the cycle is expected to turn around and it has turned around, although it got delayed a little bit by the COVID, but uh, that's where the current uh, status or the current residential real estate cycle is. So in the residential real estate, broadly two things are happening. One is as per the underlying nature or as per the underlying structure of this industry, we are currently in the expansion or growth phase. Secondly, for last almost six to seven years, the prices have been stagnant. In some cases, the prices have even corrected. But on the other side, the income of the people has been raising. One can argue whether it was 6%, 8%, 10%, whatever CAGR one likes to take, uh, one can take. But the income has been growing. So today, people are in far better position. What we call is the affordability, where the numerator, which is the price of the house, is almost same for last seven years. But the denominator, which is the annual income, that has grown up. So the affordability is at a far better, better level. And that's what has resulting into the improved traction or improved sales. Naturally, the couple of concerns have been the increased uh, input cost, which have resulted in a uh, little bit price changes, which we are exhibiting. And secondly, the mortgage rates, which were almost decadal low till almost three eight months or four months back, those are slowly inching up. However, uh, that uh, dents the sentiment a little bit, but it's so far, uh, the impact has not been great, at least in terms of number of sales. Uh, this is the broad uh, overview of commercial real estate. And here the parameters track are what is the net absorption plus new completion and the vacancy. And as you will uh, see, the from this is from second quarter of 2020 till first quarter of 2022, when the COVID uh, significantly impacted. Um, how the uh, how the of grade A office stock in India uh, has experienced the changes. Uh, before that, to give you an idea, the grade A office stock in India is roughly about 700 million square feet. Uh, and just to give you a comparison, the Manhattan district in New York, just one part of that city has about 500 million square feet of grade A stock. And as a country, India as a whole, we are at about 700. So that's the kind of gap uh, which exists and there's, we believe there's significant room for growth and expansion of this sector. Secondly, on an annual basis, pre-COVID, the average annual absorption was about 40 million per square feet of grade A office, which roughly translates into 10 million per quarter. Uh, and if you see the light blue uh, grass uh, columns, uh, it had gone down almost to about 3 million. The first quarter of 2022, it has bounced back to 11. The second quarter, uh, the numbers are just getting out, but those will surpa uh, surplus this, surpass this. So quarter four of 2021, quarter one of 2022, and even this quarter, it's 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 bouncing back uh, significantly. And uh, Bangalore and the southern cities predominantly where, uh, which are where predominantly the action is because of the IT whether it's Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, and even Pune up to a larger extent, uh, these are uh, doing uh, significantly well. In terms of the nature of uh, occupiers or the people who are leasing this, uh, you will see till almost 2020, the half or more than half was predominantly ITITs. But after that, the pattern is evolving. Still, ITITS is naturally still one of the dominant place. But e-commerce uh, and significantly the co-working, they have become a dominant player in terms of absorption. And then there are others like whether it's the uh, BFSI, uh, telecom and healthcare, they are also form significant part in the absorption. Uh, rentals, uh, again, the southern markets plus Pune, uh, 
they 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 are growing at a, a steady play a steady pace uh, during the covid uh, there is an impact but i think it's important to note that the rentals they are not gone down they have been stable in, in some places in some place there was minor correction but overall the direction is it's, it's growing also the other point i wanted to uh, highlight is even uh, and i'll go back to the previous slide uh, even in terms of absorption and the number you, you see here this is what we call is the net absorption so this will be net of cancellations if any so that number although the rate of growth is reduced but the absorption is still positive so to give you an idea in 2020 and 2021 the absorption of grade a office space in india was about 25 to 26 million square which is 60 percent of the normal but again uh, for the sake of repetition and mind you it may be at 60 percent but it was ne never a negative number so uh, unlike the popular thought or view that you know with work from home uh, etc this sector must be not doing so great and uh, everybody must have given their office space in reality although the physical occupancy may have been low or for some time it was almost zero but nobody has given up their spaces those were occupied and now it's it's growing up well uh, and the last point before i conclude my session uh, is uh, in commercial real estate today we have three listed reits plus uh, uh, there is ascendas reit uh, which is listed in singapore but the underlying assets are in india and dlf has a, com a subsidiary called as dlf cyber city developers private limited which is again a listed in so there are five listed companies who own and operate about 120 million square feet of grade office space. So that is roughly about 17 odd percent of the overall grade office stock of India. And these listed players, uh, they act as a barometer. So if you want to know what's happening in the commercial real estate, just look at these five listed companies. And I'm saying these five particularly because they are listed and you get the data on a quarterly basis. And it, it will, whether you know you want to see, uh, look at the occupancy uh, levels or the vacancy, which is a outcome of that, uh, or the what is the rentals, uh, and even they give you collection, any parameter you want to track, you just look at that and that will give you idea of how commercial real estate is uh, is doing so very briefly in terms of vacancy yes the vacancy in uh, kind of increased during the covid but the impact is only to the tune of on an average about five or six percent not like 30 percent 50 percent or 60 percent that that's the extent of, of vacancy secondly in terms of rental the rentals also have not gone down in fact they have been stable in some cases they have input so uh, that's that's all i have in my formal presentation and uh, I hope I try to uh, limit within the time allotted. Uh, and I'll stop here. And uh, if time permits, we can take some questions or happy to uh, get back uh, to any questions that you all may have.